So welcome to this webinar where Matthew Harrit from Stanford University will tell us how he and his colleagues are working to make Web Protege compatible with labeled property graph representation of all ontologies. The webinar is organized by the Ontologies Community of Practice of the CGIR platform for Big Data and Agriculture. And I'm Céline Aubert, the Communication Coordinator for the COP, and I will facilitate the webinar. And so now let me introduce you to Matthew Orich, software engineer in the Biomedical Informatics Research Group at Stanford University. He works on the Protege project, where it's the development of Protege and Web Protege, two of the most widely open source all ontology engineer toolkits. The floor is yours, Matthew. Okay, thanks, Celine. So as Celine said, I'm Matthew Horridge. I'm the lead software engineer on the Protege project at Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research in California. And today I'm going to be presenting some joint work with my colleagues from Stanford, uh, Raphael and Joseph and Mark, and from BASF, uh, Jürgen, uh, Jose and Alexander. Um, Jürgen's going to join me at the end for the questions uh, in this session. Uh, so the uh, I work on the Protégé project, and uh, this is a long-running project in the lab of Prof. Mark Musen at the Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research. And we produce Protégé, uh, the Protégé suite of tools, and these are tools for creating viewing and editing ontologies, ontologies being uh, structured knowledge representation artifacts that capture the important concepts and relationships that hold between them in some domain of interest. We have over uh, 365,000 registered protege users and uh, we have uh, over 21,000 uh, current subscribers to our mailing lists. Protege is used in academia, industry and government and all of our software is open source. We regularly receive uh, code con contributions and improvements made by Protege users and third party researchers as plugins to the core system and as code contributions to the core uh, system itself. There are two main versions of Protege, Desktop Protege and Web Protege. So here you see a screenshot of Desktop Protege both of these tools allow users to create and edit ontologies, OWL ontologies. And OWL is the web ontology language, and this is a worldwide web consortium recommendation for knowledge representation on the web. So this, this tool you, hear, you see here, Desktop Protégé, this is a traditional uh, standalone application and that can be downloaded and used on a single machine for editing ontologies. And as I mentioned, we also have uh, Web Protégé. And Web Protégé is a cloud-based ontology editing environment that users can access using a web browser uh, for real-time geographically distributed collaborative ontology editing. Both Desktop Protégé and Web Protégé are open source. They're licensed under the BSD2 clause license and they're free to use. We also provide a hosted solution for the Web Protégé community at webprotégé.stanford.edu. And here anyone can uh, go on and they can create an account and then they can create ontology projects. People just need to sign up to create the account. Um, as of this week, we have over 87,000 uh, user accounts and we have just over 130,000 um, our ontology projects on this hosted version of Web Protégé. Besides the hosted version, we produce uh, releases though that third parties can download and run privately. And this is how uh, BASF, um, our collaborators, uh, use Web Protégé in their installation. So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on some work that we did with BASF. And I'm going to be talking about our collaboration to produce a version of Web Protégé for scalable knowledge graph development with label property graphs. So before I go any further, um, I just want to go over a few points about Web Protégé for those of you that don't know it. 
Web Project Share were designed to allow users to collaboratively edit on ontologies. It features various aids for collaboration. So just to give you a flavor, uh, we have um, tools for change tracking in there. Changes are tracked by user, entity, timestamp, and they're replayable so that you can uh, get to any intermediate version of an ontology. Um, we have, or you can use them for completing diffs and also for rollback. We have a simple but effective issue-based system. Our users can post discussion threads per entity or per object in the ontology. And these can be managed and resolved. And we also have hooks in the system for change notifications. So users can be notified of changes to the ontology, changes to parts of the ontology, and posted discussions over uh, Slack and email. As I mentioned, Web Protégé works with a language called OWL, and this is the web ontology language. And it's the latest standard in ontology languages. It's the most widely used ontology language in the world. And an OWL ontology then is uh, simply a set of statements, and we call these statements axioms. So to make things a little bit more concrete, I'm going to give you a few examples of the kinds of statements that we can make in OWL. So I've got some um, axioms that you might imagine from a chemistry ontology here um, about chemicals, about atoms and uh, chemical elements. So here we've got um, some an axiom, a potassium atom is an alkali metal atom. Uh, an alkali metal atom is a metal atom. These are a subclass of axioms, so they state that one class in the ontology, a class being a representation of um, a set of things that have something in common, they say that one class is a more specific class of another class. The standard weight, uh, atomic weight of potassium is 39.1. Uh, here we've got a, another subclass of axiom with a class and um, a kind of complex class expression which specifies uh, some kind of relationship along this um, property has atomic weight or value. Um, elemental potassium contains potassium atoms. Again, we've got a complex class expression here, and that's specifying a relationship between elemental potassium and potassium atoms along this contains property. The symbol for potassium is K. This is an extra logical statement. So all the other ones up until now have been logical. And this is an annotation assertion. And um, something, uh, I've got the wrong example there, but something more complex, so a potassium oxide molecule has two potassium atoms and one oxygen atom. And you would do that with a complex class expression too. Um, I've just shown you some simple examples of axioms here in OWL. Um, and these are simple examples, but OWL is a highly expressive language. And it provides a rich set of primitives and constructors for building ontologies. It's a worldwide web consortium standard, and the worldwide web consortium is the key standards body for web technologies uh, from HTML and CSS through to knowledge representation languages like the resource description framework, NL. One of the goals of Web Protégé is to attain the complexity of OWL and the intimidation factor that this complexity brings with it. To this end, Web Protégé provides quite a simple out-of-the-box user interface. And class descriptions and individual descriptions are simply displayed as frames of information, as you see on the left-hand side here. So you see a simple frame of information, which just looks like a record structure. And this is the main display in Web Protégé. On the right hand side, what you see is the underlying OWL representation or the OWL code. And I don't expect you to read all of this now. I just want you to notice that OWL is an expressive ontology language. And there's a fair amount of complexity that is under the hood. And we do our best to shield the user from this. Beyond this simple interface, I just want to mention that we can also add customizable form based presentations and simple visualizations that provide controlled knowledge entry and provide an efficient and pleasing way uh, to browse ontologies for both neophytes and experienced users. 
So what you see here is a form-based presentation of the ontology on the, on the previous slide. Historically, the majority of the funding for this project, project project has come from the National Institutes of Health. And um, we've also received funding from the National Cancer Institute as Protégé is their editing platform for the National Cancer Institute of the Sor National Cancer Institute Thesaurus. For a long time, our primary focus has therefore been on supporting the biomedical engineering community. And this community has led the way in terms of uh, producing uh, application oriented ontologies such as the gene ontology and Kebi, amongst many others, and leading the way in best practice as well. More recently, we've been seeing more and more interest in the use of protege and web protege for ontology editing in commercial settings. And commercial ontologies, which are also known as knowledge graphs, uh, tend to be much larger than what we, the protege team, have traditionally been used to working with. And I'll mention some of the ontologies that are, con con this, that are currently considered large ontologies for us. Bear in mind that we measure the size of an ontology by the number of axioms that it contains, so the number of statements that the ontology contains. Um, these axioms can have a rich complex structure, but at the top level, they're just statements about the domain that is modeled by the ontology. So the first ontology that I'll mention is Kebi, and this is the ontology about chemical entities of biological interest. And it contains roughly two and a quarter million axioms and that describe 138 classes. So remember a class uh, from our point of view is just a description that describes a set of uh, instances or objects that have something in common. A similarly sized ontology is the National Cancer Institute Thesaurus. And um, this, this um, contains uh, two and a half million axioms as well. And this describes over 157,000 classes. And again, by uh, traditional measures, these are large ontologies. So now we come to the ontology that BASF work with. And this is the chemistry ontology. And it's really in a league of its own. So uh, this ontology, out of all the ontolo enterprise ontologies that we've seen, um, the BASF chemistry ontology is by far the largest. So from our point of view, it's very, very, very large. It contains over 700 million axioms. And this means that it's three orders of magnitude larger in terms of axioms than what we originally designed with protege for. From the outset, making Web Protégé work with this ontology has been tremendously challenging. And to put it bluntly, without modification, the existing version of Web Protégé just wouldn't have coped with an ontology this size. So when we uh, began our collaboration with BASF, they were already using the Neo4j software, successfully using the Neo4j software, for storing and querying their ontology in their internal applications. Um, Neo4j, for those of you that don't know it, is a graph database and it works with labeled property graphs or LPGs. And I'll explain what uh, labeled property graphs are in a bit more detail in a moment. But I'd like to be clear that uh, BASF came to us with the objective of making their protege work with Neo4j or more generally labeled property graphs. So in recent years, label property graphs have grown significant, uh, interest in label property graphs has grown significantly. And there's particularly heavy usage in industry and a large amount of interest in academia now too. Um, we ourselves were therefore interested in taking this opportunity to, to explore the intersection of label property graphs, OWL and ontology editing. While we initially worked with Neo4j, I just want to mention that this work is not specific to Neo4j, rather our specifications use label property graphs as a language, and so it's generic enough to work with any graph database that supports um, LPGs and the related standards. So before I go any further, I'd just like to state up from what our achievements are. 
and um, what I'll show you in this talk. So we produced a lossless transformation of OWL into label property graphs, or more precisely, OWL syntax into label property graph syntax. And this transformation is actually bidirectional so that we can transform from an OWL ontology into a label property graph and then transform in the reverse direction from the label property graph um, back into exactly the same ontology. And um, we've produced a tool that can convert our ontologies in any OWL compatible uh, syntax, such as Turtle or RDFXML uh, or OWL functional syntax into label property graphs. And we produced a version of Web Protege that interfaces with Neo4j as a backend. And this allows label property graph representations of our ontologies that are stored in Neo4j to be browsed and edited in Web Protege. So um, let's take a look at what a label property graphs are and look at them in a slightly more detail. So a label property graph is um, essentially a directed graph. It's defined in terms of nodes, relationships, labels, and properties. And nodes may be connected via directed relationships, as you can see here. Labels are used to label nodes and relationships, and a node can have multiple labels while a relationship may have a single label. Um, properties uh, we've got as well, and these are sets of key value pairs, and these may be attached to both nodes and relationships. So in this example here that you see on this slide, we have three nodes, and one of the nodes has the label element, this node down on the left here, while the other two nodes are labeled with the labels, the label atom. So we've got two atom nodes here, but distinct nodes. Um, it's conventional that node labels are prefixed with colons, like you see here. And so going from left to right, we have a relationship that connects this first node labeled with elements to this second node labeled with atom. And the relationship is labeled with contains. Um, and then from this uh, second node uh, through to the final node, we've got this uh, relationship here labeled with is a. So as you can see, each node in each relationship have a set of properties associated with it here. And um, as I said before, these are key value pairs and they can have basic data associated with them in the forms of strings, numbers, or dates. That, that kind of basic, um, those kind of basic data types. In this example, then, we have uh, used properties on the node to specify human readable names for nodes. So you can see here, we've got um, elemental potassium as a property on the other, this node here. And on these other two nodes, we've got potassium atom as a name, as a property, uh, key value. And on this final node here, we've got the name alkali metal atom as a property as well. Um, so uh, on the relationships, I've just used properties here to specify some metadata, such as the date that the, um, or you can imagine that this, this is the date that this, this relationship was added to the graph. And maybe this thing here is the source that provides some provenance information saying where it's from. So the basic idea though is we can attach these sets of properties to nodes and labels. And this is where the property part of label property graphs comes from. If you're familiar with the resource description framework, RDF, then you'll notice some significant differences here. Um, so I'm not going to go into those, but an example of this is that nodes don't have IRIs or actually any other kind of identifier. Um, nevertheless, I think you'll agree that all of this looks fairly intuitive. People like to draw out these uh, graphs and label them like this. One final point that I will stress though, is that all of the label names and all of the property names that I've used here have no intrinsic meaning. So is a and contains, they might look like ontological relationships, but they're not, they're just label names 
that I coined, and they have no meaning beyond the fact that they're strings that label relationships. So now we know what label property graphs are, we can think about how we might actually use this formalism uh, to represent ontologies, how we could write ontologies in this formalism. So as I mentioned, when we started this project, BASF were already working with a label property graph, um, representation of their ontology and the chemistry ontology. And they were using Neo4j for this. And this representation was fairly straightforward and dare I say that it was idiomatic. So in other words, the representation seemed like a perfectly natural way to represent ontological statements in a label property graph. So what they did was uh, label, what they had was labeled uh, nodes with class, and these were used to represent classes in the ontology, and relationships between these nodes were represented um, like this. So they either had isa for representing subclass of, um, subclass of axioms, and um, or they had uh, labels for representing domain relationships between classes, such as has part. And properties were used to specify the IRIs and human readable labels or annotations and textual definitions. So here, you, here I've just uh, specified in the properties, the IRIs, so the internationalized resource identifiers that all classes in OWL have, and annotation values such as RDFS label. This is an annotation property in OWL, um, providing a human readable class name for, the, for, the, for these classes. So this simple representation works well for the BASF chemistry ontology because although the ontology is extremely large in size, it's actually fairly simple in terms of its expressivity and syntax. Um, however, BASF wanted to try and wanted to work with and reuse other ontologies, in particular some mobile library ontologies, and they wanted to use OWL in general, so arbitrary OWL ontologies. So what they needed was a label property graph representation that could accommodate arbitrary to L ontologies and support lossless round tripping from OWL to so label property graphs and back to OWL. So I'm now going to talk about some of the issues of representing OWL in label property graphs with the goal of illustrating some of the design choices that we made when and considering and designing our, our um, OWL uh, to label property graph mapping. Ultimately, uh, OWL as a language has several features that prevent us from using this idiomatic approach like this. So I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on OWL. Um, so I can go through some of the nuances of representing an OWL ontology in a lossless way. And the axioms that I showed you before were very simple statements. So the axioms about potassium atoms and uh, elemental potassium uh, were very simple OWL statements, but OWL is actually a semantically expressive and syntactically rich language. So I'm just gonna move away from chemistry for the purposes of this uh, illustration. And I've, I've got a domain here for it. So we're just gonna talk about uh, dogs and dog owners. Um, so if you look at the simple axiom here, dog owner is a subclass of pet owner. This says that all dog owners are also pet owners. We, we saw axioms of this form before where you've got a subclass of B and A and B are class names. OWL, however, allows us to use complex class expressions anywhere where we can use class names. So for example, I could write a person and has pet some dog. Don't worry too much about this syntax here. I'll explain it in a moment. Um, person and has pet some dog, subclass of dog owner. So here we've got this complex class expression on the left hand side of this, uh, this subclass of keyword where uh, before we had a class name. So the outer expression on the left-hand side here is built of two kinds of class expressions. And we have in here a sum values from restriction, has pet some dog. And this uses this keyword sum, and this keyword basically describes anything that has a pet, has pet relationship to something that is a dog. 
And this sum values from expression is nested inside this intersection if, uh, using this keyword and, along with the class name person. And then we have this subclass of axiom as before um, with this complex left-hand side and we've got a uh, right-hand side here. So this basically says any person that has some uh, dog as a pet is a dog owner. So we've got, rather than just a name here, we have some kind of internal structure and something that's more expressive. And I've used a subclass of axiom here, but actually there's a lot of other kinds of axioms that I could have used. So here we've got an equivalent uh, classes axiom equivalent to, and this has this implication in, in both directions. So here we've got person and has pets and dog equivalent to dog owner. And this basically says any person that has a pet that is a dog and um, is it any person that has a pet that's a dog is a dog owner and the other way around as well. Um, all dog owners are people that have at least one pet that is a dog. So we've got some kind of bi-directional implication in the actual axiom here. It's not just in one direction. Um, so you've seen subclass of and equivalent to, but actually um, in OWL, um, there's many different types of axioms and um, other constructors as well. So in total, um, OWL's got six types of entities. So entities are just basic things in the domain. It's got data ranges, six different types of those for describing you know, numeric ranges and, and other kinds of data types and restrictions on data types. It's got um, 18 types of these class expressions. So as well as class names, it's got 17 different types of complex class expressions. You saw one on this previous slide, the sum values from restriction. And it's got 36 different types of axioms. So we've seen subclass of and equivalent classes, but it's got um, all these different types as well. And indeed, um, axioms, these axioms containing these nested class expressions um, are used in naturally occurring ontologies, including prominent biomedical ontologies, such as the gene ontology, which contains many axioms of the form that you see below. So here, this is uh, where I've taken a screenshot from Protégé. And there are over 59,000 of these kind of uh, complex um, class inclusion axioms, if you like, in the gene ontology. So axioms where both sides are complex class expressions. And here we see something that is part of a nucleus. In this axiom here, this says anything that's part of a nucleus is disjoint with anything that's part of a cytoplasm. So if you know um, anything about cell, cell biology, even just based on basic stuff, you know that a nucleus is disjoint from the cytoplasm which surrounds it. So anything that's part of the nucleus is disjoint from the cytoplasm. And that's expressed here in this axiom. Similarly, we've got something here where we've got a bit of negation. So this says that anything that is a cell that isn't um, part of a nucleus is a cell that's a bearer of some a nucleate, and vice versa, because this is an equivalent classes axiom. So you may or you may not understand these, but the point is we've got this kind of high level of syntactic richness in OWL. Uh, it's not just some kind of straightforward taxonomy uh, language. Another issue that we come across when we're considering trying to represent um, OWL axioms in LPGs is that OWL2 allows annotation of axioms. So we've got our basic statements, axioms in OWL, but we can actually make statements about these axioms too using annotations. And this functionality is typically used to provide provenance. So for example, here you can see a screenshot of the Uber anatomy ontology. And this has uh, various external definitions um, for heart. And I've displayed these here. Uh, so I've got heart, heart selected in my protege and these are the external definitions that come up. And each external definition here is represented with an annotation assertion axiom. Um, and each of these annotation assertion, assertion axioms has annotations on it, specifying the date that it was retrieved, um, what the actual, where the definition comes from, the ontology where it comes from, and um, 
and who, and who provided it. So as you've seen, labeled property graphs provide a nice way to record basic information on nodes and relationships using uh, key value property pairs. And at first glance, properties, label uh, property graph properties look ideal for representing annotations. However, in our all, annotations aren't simply key value pairs. Um, they may um, have different types of values that don't correspond to simple types, the simple types provided by LPG property values. And simple strings may be given language tags as an example. But also annotations may be themselves annotated and this can go on to arbitrary depths. So this is uh, something that we have to consider as well. And then the final issue that I want to mention um, here when we were designing our mapping was um, an issue to do with round tripping. So consider this uh, simple idiomatic representation of a null statement as a label property graph. And this says that, um, so we've got labels down here, remember, so A, B, and C. And this says that um, an A is a kind of B, and the B has a part that's C. And when we think about how we could actually write this down in OWL, um, and we think about constructing OWL axioms from this, there are actually uh, a couple of ways that we could do this. So just remember that this kind of has part relationship and a class is represented um, with this uh, some values from restriction in OWL. So uh, has parts in C. And we can construct this in at least, we could represent this, something equivalent to this in OWL, this label property graph in OWL in two plausible ways. So either um, we could use two axioms here. So we could say A is a subclass of B to represent this node here A, this node here B, and the is A. So this sub, the first axiom represents this first part, first hop. Um, and then this second hop could be represented by saying B, um, plausibly represented by saying that B is a subclass of, is a subclass of has parts from C. So all instances of B have parts that are C. So this would give us the two hops. But we could also think about it like this. So this axiom would conceivably represent this as well. So here we've got uh, things nested. So we have A is a subclass of B and it has a part that's C all, all in one axiom. Um, so this is the point where the idiomatic representation, this nice idiomatic representation here is lossy. And we can't actually get back to what we started in OWL and this poses problems for displaying an ontology in Word Protégé and for serializing it out in our OWL syntax because Word Protégé is based on axioms and we want to get back our ontology document in OWL as well. There's just a few other kind of um, desiderata that we had as well. So um, besides this overall uh, requirement for lossless round tripping and the ability to support complex, arbitrarily complex L ontologies to label property graphs, we had some other desiderata listed here. And these are somewhat specific to the use of a label property graph as the back end for web protege or rather in more general terms as the back end for an OWL ontology editor because we kind of view things as L axioms uh, in the editor. So we need to be able to query and update axioms in the ontology held in label property graph. And to do this, we need to query um, in terms of entities and entity frames. And an entity frame is just a set of axioms that describe a particular entity such as a class, and they're used to derive information that's presented in WebProtege when you click on a class. So the, the pane that you see in WebProtege, WebProtege collects together the axioms that comprise the axiom frame and then renders them into this kind of tabular format. Um, so here are some of the things that we need to be able to ask. Get the axioms that comprise the frame for an entity, as I've just said. Get the axioms that mention an entity. This is for usage. So you want to know where an entity has been used, if you, especially if you want to delete the entity or, or switch it out for something else. Um, 
you might want to get the axioms of a particular type that mention an entity and we use this for constructing class hierarchies so give me all the subclass of axioms where the superclass is this particular entity in order to generate the children in the hierarchy for that particular entity um, uh, get the different types of axioms used in the ontology and get the different types of class expressions used in the ontology so this is done for profiles to compute profiles uh, to look at the expressivity of the ontology and give you some idea of what the ontology contains so as you see everything is basically axiom centric so all of this i hope you see points to a label property graph representation of our ontologies where we identify class expressions and axioms specifically identify class expressions and axioms um, and this is what we have done so what we actually do is we in our mapping we use nulls to explicitly represent axioms class expressions data ranges and annotations and we label these um, nodes with labels that identify their L types. So let's take a uh, look at a few examples just to give you a flavor of this. So suppose we have uh, this axiom uh, here, A subclass of B, and this is translated into this label property graph here that you see here. So uh, we have a node that represents the actual axiom at the top here. And this is labeled with the specific axiom type. So in this case, subclass of. Uh, but it's also a class axiom and also in general terms is an axiom. So we label it with class axiom and axiom two. And this allows us to retrieve the axiom if we want to inspect class axioms in the ontology, um, for example. Um, next, we have two relationships to uh, nodes that represent the left-hand side. Um, of the class expression, so this the A on the left-hand side and, in other words, a subclass, and on the right-hand side, the superclass, so uh, B on the right-hand side. And in this case, uh, these are simply class names, and we label these nodes, these two nodes here, with class, um, and classes are also class expressions, and they're also entities, so it gets labeled class expression and entity. So if we want to know what entities are in the signature of the ontology, we can just query for things that are labeled with entity. And then finally, we actually denote IRIs that name entities using relationships like this. And we, we um, point to a specific IRI node. And um, the IRI node itself has got this kind of uh, property here, lexical form that contains the complete IRI. Um, you might be wondering why we use distinct nodes to represent uh, IRIs here. And well, this has to do with the way that IRIs can be used in OWL and in particular the way that they're used in annotations. So OWL annotation axioms uh, reference IRIs, they're attached to IRIs and uh, or rather OWL annotations are attached to IRIs and not entities. Although Protégé makes it look like they're attached to entities. I'll show you an example that illustrates this. So here we've got two axioms. We had the one that we had on the first slide, so A subclass of B, and our second axiom here, B RDFS label uh, class B, this is an annotation assertion that says label B with this RDFS label class B. So this actually denotes the um, an annotation on the IRI for class B, even though, as I say, Protégé makes it appear that it annotates the class B in the Protégé user interface. Um, and this uh, relationship is shown um, over here. So here we've got our axiom, uh, our subclass axiom. This was the same as what was on the previous slide. And over here, we've got now our annotation assertion axiom representation. So this, uh, contains a node for the annotation assertion, and it identifies it with a, a label as well, saying this is an annotation axiom, and in more general case, it's an axiom. And this points down now and links to the IRI that was also mentioned in the entity that was mentioned in the subclass of axiom. Um, 
we have the literal, so class B um, down here, and literals are their own nodes as well. And this is because in OWL, literals can have three components. So they can have a lexical form, which you see here, class A, and they can have um, a language tag, which you also see here, in this case, EN for English. And what isn't shown here, but um, you can also add is a custom a, a data type or an L2 data type or indeed a custom data type. So there's three kind of components that are here when you're talking about literals and the simple kind of key value pairs or properties in label property graphs are insufficient to capture this. So we have to, we decided to make literals the wrong nodes as well. The final example I want to show you is one involving a complex class expression. And here we have um, on the left-hand side, a class name. As in the previous example, so this is just class name A. And um, on the right-hand side, we have a some values from class expression with a filler of B and a property part of. As with the other OWL types, some values from restriction here, so it's super class along the top here. Um, we label this with the fact that it says object some values from class expression. And um, this the class expression itself is represented with a specific node, as you can see here. Um, and then it's got relationships for the filler down through here, the filler B, and the property down through here. With the property has part. And the final thing I want to mention is that if we had annotations on these axioms, they would hang off the main axiom node here, and we'd have a node for each um, annotation, and these nodes could chain down through as necessary to represent the depth of the nesting of annotations on the axioms. So I'm not going to go into any more detail about the mappings. Um, I think you've kind of seen the main points there, our translation. Um, but the specification is available for you to take a look at. And this is on GitHub, uh, github.com slash prototype project slash owl2lpg. And um, this repository contains the actual source code for the specification. So if you find any problems with it, you could make a pull request. And um, there's also an issue tracker. So if you've got questions or you want to raise any problems, you can do. Just to note that if you just Google for L2 LPG, this brings up all of the links as the first hits to this repository. If you do go and look at the specification, those of you that are familiar with L2 and Hawkeye amongst you might notice that um, this specification closely parallels the L2 specification in terms of the structure and, and the vocabulary used. And this was this was quite deliberate. So all of our axioms end up representation of our axioms in LPGs rep, end up being tree-like structures as axioms are in the L2 specification. And they have leaf nodes that represent IRIs or literals. And as I say, this was deliberate. We didn't want to coin node, edge, and property names that deviated from the actual OWL specification. So to summarize at this point, um, we've got this approach representing OWL ontologies in labeled property graphs, and we can capture anything that can be expressed in OWL2 using a labeled property graph. And it's a clean, and it's a uniform representation, and it's straightforward to query. The uh, mapping that we've got is bidirectional so that we can round trip and go from an our ontology to an LPG and back to an ontology without any loss of information. One of the main uh, points of this project was to create a backend for Web Protégé that would work with a label property graph database. And at the time that we did this work, BASF was using Neo4j as their database of choice. And we therefore undertook the task of providing an implementation of Web Protégé and the backend indexes of Web Protégé that was backed by Neo4j. So before I show you the results of that exercise, 
I want to mention that as a standalone part of the work, we've produced a library and a command line tool, and this can take an arbitrary owl ontology and it can either convert it to into a commemorated set comma separated values file that then can be imported directly into Neville J, um, or it can be used to execute the appropriate cipher commands to create a label property graph in a Neo4j instance. And these tools are available on GitHub in the Protege project, project repository L2 LPG translator. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, some snippets of a video showing the chemistry ontology that we stored in our, our LPG format in Neo4j uh, as being browsing Web Protege. Um, Web Protege uses this module L2 LPG translator library to make the appropriate cipher calls to Neo4j and to retrieve the axioms that are used to drive this display. So I should mention that this video is formed from a set of clips that have spliced together um, to form that were originally part of a longer video. And this means there's some jumps in places, but what I haven't done is um, I haven't cut out or sped up any parts of the video uh, that would distort in the performance, uh, distort the impression of performance or the fluidity of browsing the ontology. So uh, here you can see that the user's browsing, the class hierarchy, and the drilling down into deeper levels in the class hierarchy from compounds through acids, organic acids, and fatty acids, and so on. And notice that the experience is quite fluid, uh, certainly very good for browsing. And as the user's uh, doing this, um, you can you can see the click on something and then the inspect the oops the inspect the inspect the uh, right hand side. So we're just going to go down through that again. Um, and when they do this, Web Protege basically retrieves all of the axioms that are necessary to render the class hierarchy names. Uh, figure out what they are and render it with the display settings and according to the display settings. And uh, when the user clicks on here, beryllium uh, zero, we get back um, some information here. And the all of that information is um, computed from the axioms that are in the frame for beryllium zero. Uh, Web Proche can display what we uh, call an graph entity graph of the selected class. So you see it here for Brilliant one plus. And this includes the selected class or individual, and it displays its position in the class hierarchy, making the path to the root obvious. Um, finally, here you can see that uh, we've got some search in there, and this is backed by the Lucene-based full, full text index capability in the upper J. And you can see that this performs pretty well uh, for an ontology that contains 33 million classes and uh, multiple labels and synonyms per class. So that's given you a flavor of um, the fluidity of browsing this hierarchy. I just want to point out that, of course, the user interface here actually exploits the fact that the fan out in class hierarchies is much, much smaller when traversing up the class hierarchy than it is when traversing down the class hierarchy. Um, and I'll come, I'll come back to that in a moment. So you may be wondering um, how large the chemistry ontology is when we convert it to a label property graph using our mapping. And here you go. Uh, so the label property graph contains over 1.3 billion nodes that uh, are linked by around 3 billion relationships. And Neo4j uh, can handle all all of these, uh, this representation of this chemistry ontology with our chosen representation. Um, and it seems responsive, responsive enough for uh, browsing and editing. And I'll just remind you that this ontology is three orders of magnitude larger than anything we've ever, ever dealt with before. So uh, those are the main points. I'm just going to wrap up the talk now. And um, I just want to talk about some limitations and also some uh, future work. So our mapping from ontologies to Neo4j knowledge graphs doesn't result in the smallest possible graphs. Um, and this is because we aim to provide coverage for the entire L2 language in a clean and uniform way. Our 
initial experiments here don't raise any red flags about this, but it, it kind of really remains to be seen how well this performs over time. Um, we could imagine other mappings that produce more compact label property graphs, but these would be more limited mappings and support far more limited fragments of L2. Um, but this is something that we could explore if there's interest in it. Um, in any case, we've attempted to build flexibility into the system so that Web Protege makes no assumption about the structure of the underlying labeled uh, property graph. And um, this means that exploring other choices wouldn't um, uh, cause too much disruption and it should be possible. Um, the second aspect that I want to discuss here is the scaling of these interface. And I kind of touched on this before, but really how can we display and filter things at the scale of the chemistry ontology? And this is an open question for us. So despite the work on the Neo4j backend that I presented here, um, our project, this project didn't uh, touch the front end at all. And it's the front end isn't designed for displaying such large ontologies. Uh, so we didn't tackle that in this project. Um, but we, you know, this is something that I feel like we should investigate going forward. And I think finally, uh, one question that's in our minds is um, how can a user build up a picture that allows them to comprehend the content of such a large knowledge graph? And this is something that we'd be interested in exploring too. So just to wrap up um, and to summarize, I'd just like to state the main things that have come out of this work. Firstly, OWL is a uh, semantically expressive and syntactically rich language. It's got many axiom and class expression constructors. And we found that idiomatic representations of our ontologies in label property graphs have shortcomings and these tend to make them lossy. And to solve this problem, we've designed and implemented a comprehensive mapping between L2 ontologies and label property graphs that allows us to store arbitrary L ontologies in uh, label property graphs. The mapping's clean and it's uniform and it's lossless. We've re-engineered Web Protege so that it can interface with Neo4j. And this gives us the ability to display extremely large knowledge graphs in Web Protege. The BASF chemistry ontology, as an example, is three orders of magnitude larger than anything we could handle before. Um, and we can now open and browse this comfortably. Finally, um, it's not just a specification we produced, uh, we've created the software library, and this allows us to extract, transform, and load ontologies into label property graphs and allows us to manipulate these labeled property graphs as uh, through the lenses of ontologies. So although we've used Neo4j here as a backend, um, the architecture is rather flexible. And the main point is that we can now map ontologies into LPGs and Web Protege can be made to work with LPGs on the backend. Um, so I think I'll stop there. And um, we'll uh, take a look at uh, and take, take any questions. Thank you very much, Matthew, for this um, deep dive in the ontology world. We have some questions, so we'll take uh, the time uh, to, well, to take the question and we'll go a bit beyond the hour. Marie-Angelique Laporte, would you like to ask your first question? Yeah, thank you, Céline. So, um, so thank you, Matthew. That, that was a very interesting uh, presentation, and, and and that's quite impressive to see like the performances that that you that you have. So, um, I have two questions. So, the first question is that uh, in your example, like in the BASF ontology, there's only classes. So, I was wondering if like your translation and, and everything co could also work when you have like a, non like a knowledge base where really you have like the classes, like, you know, where you define the domain and all the axioms and, and then the instances that are really the, the data. I mean, mm -hmm. can your, like, you know, when you do the, yeah, okay, uh, would it work also or does it work only with classes? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So the app, the uh, translation is complete for individuals and instances and different axiom types relating to individuals. So class assertions, so things that state an individual is an instance of a given type in the ontology or a complex type. 
um, property assertions, uh, negative property assertions, and so on. So it can handle all of those kinds of things. And I think actually one of the attractive things here is that you can potentially combine in the label property graph data and including non-ontological data along with the ontology and have these direct linkages. So uh, yes, it can handle this data and um, it can represent the full kind of gamut of um, individual um, based axiom types. Yeah. Okay, cool. And and my second question is more about rezoning. Like, you know, the, the reason why, I mean, there's all these axiom in, in the ontology is because you want to rezone over the data. So I was, uh, yeah, wondering um, how or where like a rezoning engine can take place in the in this process, because I mean, I, I doubt that this is going to happen in, in Neo, Neo4j, so it's going to be more on the web protege part. So yeah, I was wondering how you see like, you know, an inference engine working with that system. Um, so this is something that we haven't uh, tackled, um, and maybe I'll, I'll just add up some remarks, and I don't know whether Jürgen wants to say something about this afterwards. Um, but from an owl point of view, I see the reasoning taking place outside, um, with, if you want to use an owl reasoner. Um, um, Jürgen might mention some different strategies in a moment, but um, you'd I, I would be look, interested in looking at some kind of model extraction techniques so you could uh, do this in a kind of piecemeal fashion and um, see how far we get with that, particularly as the BASF ontology, as I say, is kind of quite limited in terms of expressivity. So I'd be interested to see the kinds of modules that you get out and um, how, um, how much those overlap. So that would be the topic of future work. But you're right, I don't have a good answer for um, how you might do the reasoning with um, our, our reasoning um, natively in Neo4j. Jürgen, do you want to say? Maybe to add to that, I mean, in the end, it's, uh, it's uh, let's say, work in preparation of, let's say, a larger uh, graph structure in a way that we really uh, combine data and ontologies and overlay, basically. Uh, explaining those things and the direction is more, uh, it's a, also using from a, from a deep learning perspective, link prediction algorithms or probabilistic reasoning yeah, in a way that say like uh, probabilistic soft logic, etc., cetera, on, on larger scale uh, on the underlying uh, graph structure uh, in a way that um, uh, let's say this is at least the, uh, the things we look into. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, I have a last question. It's like a silly question. I mean, uh, once you uh, converted like the ontology into Neo4j, like the graph becomes quite complicated. So do you have like, you know, patterns of queries or uh, cipher queries? I mean, that uh, if someone is interested in getting- Yes, from my side, but maybe you can catch that in a way. If you want it like- Yes, so- one of the nice things about this representation, so we, we do have the cipher queries because that's what we use to get the axioms back out of Neo4j and to kind of browse them in this piecemeal fashion in Web Protégé. One of the nice things about this representation is that it's uniform and the cipher queries are pretty simple actually for getting back an axiom. So once you identify a node that's pertinent to um, give an entity, say, for the entity frame. The cipher query straightforwardly traverses down the paths of different lengths in the axiom, you know, different lengths in the axiom until it hits the leaves, which are either IRIs or literals. And it pulls back all of the nodes from that that are contain that basically contain the representation for the axiom. So there's no, nothing difficult about these queries. Um, we did some performance tuning, but the, the queries themselves are fairly straightforward. Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, kind of uh, people who are quite new to Cypher could actually take a look at them and read them. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for the question. Maybe to add, I mean, uh, let's say on one side, we have, of course, that, uh, let's say, uh, conversation. Uh, or conversion that we see here that uh, really, let's say, as Matthew has stated, that loss was transformation between the worlds. Yeah, on the other hand, I mean, we also had a, a completely uh, compact <laughs> representation of the 
underlying ontology. It's, I mean, it's a rather, let's say from construct rather simple, let's say, but large in size. Uh, uh, as a pure label property graph that comes along with some, let's say, what was it, 120 million nodes and 350 million edges and so on. Of course, they're not in that formal uh, way, so, but the, the question is really in between, uh, can we further optimize that structure without losing anything and especially not that lossless bi-directional, um, let's say, uh, conversion mechanism between, let's say, the old world and the label property growth world. But uh, there might be also room for improvement on one side to make it more compact and maybe even make the queries even more easier to work on that structure. Yeah? So that's basically something to investigate in the future. Yeah, and, and to that point and, and to the question, actually, I just would like to add that, you know, one of the things when you've got this representation is that it's quite easy to construct a view using Neo that uh, filters out some parts and just say includes the basic taxonomy and the axioms that will make up the uh, taxonomy rather than the full kind of um, the, the kind of direct relationships that will make up the taxonomy rather than the um, reified axioms. So yeah, I think uh, having different views as well would be a, uh, a, a way to go for different applications, downstream applications that is. Great, thank you very much. So I can see that we have a last question from Sun Ho. Sun Ho, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, the first of all, I, I really appreciate that the, the, your presentation since we are looking for those kind of similar tools which convert our to the uh, Neo, uh, Neo4j uh, knowledge graph. The one, I mean, you might answer this question before, but just for confirmation, uh, since we have our version of the ontology, um, is it possible to right now to convert into knowledge graph in the web protege? Um, it's this doesn't work with our web protege.stanford.edu at the moment. Um, oh, okay. We haven't just deployed that. That version's uh, running uh, kind of a little bit behind. So this is something that we uh, need to work on. And but you can go and get it. Um, you, you, you could down you could get your ontology uh -huh. you could write with that dimension in the command line tool uh, to get it into uh, this format you can ingest into neo or direct, directly create in neo so. okay maybe if we don't mind maybe can i uh, contact you by email and then we can discuss more how to we collaborate together sure yeah okay thank you so much yeah you're welcome thanks for the question Thank you. Well, I don't see any more question in the chat. So uh, a lot of thank you. Thank you very much, Mati, for preparing this uh, presentation and taking the time uh, to answer the question. Thank you, Jürgen, for being here as well. And uh, thank you for those who have logged in today. I will now hand it over to Elizabeth Arno, the COP lead. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Céline, and uh, thank you very much, Matthew, and the team for being online and for explaining so much in detail the work you've been achieving, which I think is very, very important work. Thank you very much to all and um, have a nice day or evening. And thanks again to the Stanford team.